G'day YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. I think. Yeah, let's have a listen to the minefield. Moment with a resident of Houston named Danielle speaking in a quite angry and distraught way with a reporter from CNN. It kind of raised, I'm going to get to what show this is and who we are in a moment, but it, it really raised for me hearing that clip, how should the media report the vast human tragedies, like the floods that have engulfed the city of Houston, like the floods that have overtaken Bangladesh and so much of South India. We tend not to reflect that much on the media's presence and its moral responsibilities in the face of natural disasters until the media suddenly becomes invasive and unavoidable, like what we've just heard here, there. But is it enough for the media just to become unobtrusive, to kind of tell the stories of human loss and heartache and heroism and then get out of the way? Or are there deeper moral responsibilities that the media has <laughs> that it neglects when it just tries to be invisible? Anyway, that's what we're talking about this week on The Minefield. I'm Scott Stevens, and my co-host is Waleed Ali. Hi, Waleed. Hi. Um, so you've really landed us in it, haven't you? I think so. <laughs> because... I do feel like this is one of those things in media where um, any way you step, you are almost certainly committing some form of moral wrong. Right? I, I've long had concerns, I was going to say misgivings, maybe that's too strong, concerns about the way that natural disaster coverage rolls out um, and the way in which people's um, tragic stories are, are sort of are turned into anecdotes for our consumption and our emotional consumption as much as mm. anything else. Um, and... Uh, there are, I, I understand, although I haven't consulted these myself, so I take it with a grain of salt, but I understand there are studies looking at um, the way that people will happily speak to media in the aftermath of a tragedy and then regret that later, um, mm. because they're not necessarily in a psychological state to make a decision that they're comfortable with at that moment. Um, they're, they're dealing with too much, although um, that resident certainly was in a state to tell us exactly what she thought about being interviewed. <laughs> In that case, but that's rare, right? And, and normally one of the things that's remarkable is the way in which people in the aftermath of natural disasters are quite happy to talk. It's, it's quite a surprising thing. But there's another element to the way in which we deal with natural disasters in media that I find fascinating. And that is not so much to do with um, the, you know, the invasion of people's private grief, I suppose. But it's more to do with how it seems that that's all we can do. That, that when we look at natural disasters, the way to cover these things is to cover them through a particular prism that is purely emotional, but it is not in any way geared towards understanding. So in other words, what I'm saying is that at that moment, the role, and it seems the only permissible role, whether that's imposed by media itself or by the expectation of the audience, the only permissible role that the media have seems to be to emote rather than to explain or to help us understand anything that's going on. And so what that has a habit of doing is crowding out big issues at the time that they are most pointed. Mm. And so in the context of a natural disaster like we've seen in Houston, not just Houston, as you say, but other parts of the world as well, in the context of a natural disaster like that, you do not talk about climate change. You just don't do it. That is a conversation that is to be had for another day, probably another day when it's more easily ignored. But at the moment, when it raises its most urgent questions for us, when it asks us the most demanding questions, that's precisely when we fall most silent as media. Not, not only do we, but we feel we must, that there would somehow be something improper um, or gauche about talking about climate change in that moment, even though it, it seems, I would have thought, so clearly relevant, particularly as, as one natural disaster after another just rolls out. I mean, I'm staggered by the number of one in a hundred year or one in 500 year events we seem to have had in the last 12 months. It just keeps happening. And if you want an illustration of how this kind of plays out, um, take, take an exchange like this one. And this is what happens when you mention something like climate change. This is an exchange between CNN's Chris Cuomo and the uh, now very famous Trump media advisor Kellyanne Conway. Here's the deal. You play amateur climatologist tonight, and I will play professional helper to those in need and, and continue in my job here as counsel to the president. It, it really is quite extraordinary because the contrast could not be made more stark there. Either you talk about climate change, and, and I would even submit to you, the, Waleed, that climate change is not the only huge issue that the flooding in Houston uh, and certainly in Bangladesh no. have, have, have thrown up. Uh, yeah. But either you discuss that, or you're interested in helping the people in need. And I think you're right that there is something, and this, in fact, is something that Pierre Bourdieu, I thought, very, very carefully. And well, you're about to take everything I wanted to 
to say. Well, yeah. no, surely not. Well, I can move, you know, on to sort of other territory if you really want me to. But, <laughs> okay, I mean, well, what have you got? It is interesting that, that, that you know, Bourdieu had this really nice idea in his analysis of television that one of the things that often happens with journalists is that a sense of propriety very easily and quickly falls over into a kind of moral injunction. In other words, this is not the kind of thing that we do. We don't shift off the intensely human, uh, uh, human interest stories, the stories of human heartache and loss and tragedy. We simply do not, we must not, as part of this medium that is so tied and tethered to the illogistic, you know, to, 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 to these, to, these, uh, these moving images, uh, uh, we don't uh, move off those into the more conceptual. And that then becomes almost a kind of professional moral injunction. All we can do here as part of our task is to tell the stories of human loss. But I think what's interesting there for me, Lily, is that one of the things that that does by simply focusing on the human stories of loss and heartache, what that does is it is it reduces the political to the anecdotal. It reduces the systemic to the merely aberrant. And I think in many ways, it actually demonstrates, and here let me move out of your territory and onto territory of my own, it really demonstrates, I think, Susan Sontag's very important moral critique of the overuse of photography. That photography can be important, but the emotions that, that images of human loss and heartache, the, 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 the emotions that those images stir up, they have to have some place to go. They have to have a narrative within which they fit, because it's the narrative that then turns those emotions into something like political resolve. And it allows those emotions uh, to not simply be extinguished in the act of emotion, but allows the emotions themselves uh, to be turned into something like political action or moral resolve. What, what do you think about that? Um, well, I think that's largely true, that, that, that as the image becomes visible, the structure becomes invisible. Yes, um, that's right. behind those things, yeah. Uh, and I think it's a major issue. But I, I think I am a little bit torn on, on this, because the idea of setting aside anything other than the human tragedy in the moment that the human tragedy is unfolding strikes me as look it's easy to critique that as a media affectation mm -hmm. right but in large part what media often does is it performs emotions right? it doesn't even necessarily have to feel them it just needs to be able to i mean you know a competent producer uh, or a competent presenter can probably just dial in whatever emotion call for in that particular moment and perform it for the microphone the camera or the the masthead or, or whatever the medium is. Um, so that you can be cynical about that. But is it not responding to something that is an utterly laudable human need to recognise that there are times in which it is good to focus and decide that nothing else matters except for the person that is in front of me? So, for example, what I might say um, is that this is, in some ways, the flip side of the kind of argument we constantly have around asylum seekers, mm -hmm. right? where if you look at the way we develop asylum seeker policy and we uh, try to justify asylum seeker policy, we do it by excluding the anecdotal in favour of the conceptual, um, whether you agree with the conceptual approach or you know the, the way in which the concepts are marshaled or not is beside the point for the moment, but, but we use the conceptual. We, we have this kind of um, narrative of meta-structural compassion through the imposition of pain and suffering upon small individual mm. cases. Um, mm. This is kind of the flip side of, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, of that, right? This is doing, if that is a problem, if we look at that and we say what gets lost there is the individual who's being harmed in the process, then how critical can we be exactly of a moment where we do the exact opposite, where we say uh, this is really just all about the individual suffering in this case. Um, this is why I wrestle with this. This is why I think it's not as straightforward as perhaps I might have thought even 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly vacillating on, on this because there is something to the sanctity of the human suffering in that moment. But I do feel that in our focus on um, performing compassion, if, even to take the most cynical version of it, performing compassion in those moments, something deeply lacking in compassion happens. And that is that we pay no attention to the way in which we, by the conducting of our daily lives, are partially complicit in, mm. in this. If, if, for example, if it's an environmental catastrophe, the way that we live, the way we structure our economy, um, the decisions we make as consumers every day, the fact that we think of ourselves as consumers in, in many, many situations, it seems um, ever-expanding mm. number of situations, 
that fact is somehow, even if infinitesimally, complicit in the environmental outcomes that we then see visited upon people in Houston. That's a have really you, hard. Do you realize, Wally, do you realize you just adopted three, I'm not saying incompatible, but three different positions? In no, I'm not, adopt, I'm not adopting any positions. That's my point. My point is that yes. I feel torn by a series of, of vectors that are pulling in completely opposite directions here, all of which I see are worthy. Yeah, and so I, I guess what I'm trying to resist is a really simple response to this. And it says, right. okay, well, um, the media never talks about anything important, or the media um, is only interested in structural issues to the um, exclusion of the suffering of lonely people. But we seem to be adopting contradictory positions on different debates. Yeah, so I think that's, that, that's right. Is can, I just, can I just push back on just two things sure. very, very briefly? One, I think it is interesting to note uh, that the rise and prevalence and ubiquity of images in the world media really coincided with the explosion and the ubiquity of human rights language in the late 70s. And I think it's no wonder that these two things were connected. In other words, human rights were something that were kind of legal concepts. And then when they were given um, uh, imaginary or photographic backing, suddenly uh, the humanity of those about whom human rights are supposed to be about. Uh, those two things were allowed to come together in a fusion that I think was very, very important. It was politically quite potent. So I, I'm not saying that these two things, the concern for the general and the concern for the particular, I'm not saying they are incompatible, and I think they do need to be in that sort of tension. But I also wonder, okay, just put climate change aside for a moment. I mean, one of, you know, two of the stories that are not being told about Houston is the extent to which sort of for-profit and profit-driven uh, urban development with little to no regulation, the paving over of wetlands, uh, um, the reduction of the very environmental factors that would allow Houston to be more susceptible to you know, dealing with this, this kind of massive increase, the massive dumping of, of water. These are the very things that have provided the conditions of possibility for the vast devastation we've seen take place, but also, also, the exploitation of federal tax credits that mean that affordable housing are increasingly being built uh, not in sustainable and protected areas, but in the very poor areas that are most susceptible to flooding in the first place. These, these for me, are huge issues that are not being told, and they go straight to the issue of complicity. So by ignoring these massive structural factors in which we are complicit in our lust after affordable housing, uh, in, the, in the premium that we place on economic growth. I think by neglecting these stories, what we're doing is we're allowing the problem to be entirely somebody else's, and we're letting ourselves off the hook. That's where the emotional content of the media's reporting to the exclusion of these other factors, that's where it becomes incredibly problematic. And, and I think the big problem there, and you're right, the big problem there is it allows us to feel morally redeemed, morally virtuous, by virtue of the fact that we care. That's that our right. emotion that's becomes right. the moral yes. act that thereby exports uh, all other moral concerns elsewhere. The, the Texas case is a good example, although I would point out the idea of the lack of regulation in Texas has been noted before, and it's something that, depending on who you ask, Texans are actually kind of proud of as part of the Texan <laughs> identity. So it's not as straightforward a uh, no, thing as, as it might be presented, although it does remind me of the Grenfell Tower situation, yes. and that was something where these questions were raised um, more or less immediately. So maybe we're absolutely nowhere in this conversation, <laughs> and we need some help, which is why I think it's <laughs> Listening to the Minefield, by the way, uh, you can listen to the show on the radio live, of course. You can stream it anytime on the ABC radio app, or you can sub subscribe to a sort of podcast where you get a little bit of extra content at the end. Uh, every once in a while, I think we get a dud guest, on, and I'm not terribly excited about who we've gotten on the show. Maybe that's happened twice. Okay, I'll call a halt to this now and come back with a new movie.